Hey y'all, this is Dr. Carmen Corder with thedrnurse.com and in this video I want to talk about some of the different oxygen delivery devices that you are going to learn about in nursing school and talk about maybe when is the best situation to use these particular different devices, um, the difference between FiO2 and liters per minute. So let's just dive right in and start talking about these oxygen delivery devices. I want to mention first though that there is a cool little infographic with this information on it and it's located under the smart study guide section of the drnurse.com so check that out as a supplement to this video. So which oxygen delivery device should you choose? Well the first one I have listed here is obviously the most commonly seen, the most commonly used um, oxygen device that you're going to see in the hospital. It's that nasal cannula, that two-prong system that fits into the patient's nose and it's hooked up to the, uh, the oxygen on the wall and you set your nasal cannula or binasal cannula according to liters per minute. Now that is the flow rate, all right? That is not the amount of oxygen they're giving, that the patient is getting. That is the flow rate that you set the dial to on the wall. And typically, we'll set the flow somewhere between one to six liters per minute with our nasal cannula. Now, what this means is that the patient is going to be getting anywhere between 25 to 45 percent FiO2. And FiO2 simply stands for fraction of inspired oxygen. So that's actually the amount of oxygen that the patient is getting. And this is the flow rate that you're setting that device to. All right. Now, it is considered a low flow device. Your um, program may, you know, break up these delivery devices into high flow versus low flow. Basically, high flow versus low flow, low flow means are we able to give a precise amount of FiO2 with this device? And if not, then it's going to be put into the low flow category. Um, if we can deliver a precise amount of FiO2, such as with the Venturi mask that we're going to talk about, that's going to be considered a high flow device. Now, when we put our patient on a nasal cannula, you know, we're sticking these two prongs in their nose and setting it to say two liters per minute and hoping that they get around 25% FiO2. Well, let's say that your patient goes into a tad bit of respiratory distress and their respiratory rate goes up, okay? Well, that FiO2 is going to be greatly decreased by that patient's tachypnea, okay? Because we cannot control how much FiO2 a patient is getting just by sticking two prongs in their nose, all right? It is not helping their respiratory effort these patients must be stable. They must be able to take good deep breaths for themselves. Nasal cannulas do not help whatsoever with ventilation, meaning removal of CO2. All right, so it's going to be considered a low flow device. Now, the next thing I have mentioned, um, number two, are the high flow nasal cannulas. And this one provided me with so much confusion when I was in nursing school. I'm like, what is the difference? Okay, this is the patient's on a high flow nasal cannula. I don't know what that means. I know the tubing is long and green, uh, but that's about all that I know. But the high flow nasal cannula is gaining a lot of traction and gaining a lot of attention as far as being useful for COPD patients. And the reason is that high flow nasal cannula can apply a PEEP effect. And now we know PEEP is positive expiratory in pressure. So that PEEP effect keeps these the alveoli open at the end of expiration by continuing to apply pressure. And so in that way, a high flow nasal cannula is going to assist with ventilation, is going to assist with um, removal of CO2 and we know with our COPD patients that is huge, right? So that's what a high flow nasal cannula is. Obviously by the name high flow, it's a high flow device. 
we can give um, a set a flow rate of up to 60 liters per minute and that's going to give the patient anywhere up to a hundred percent FiO2. Um, now you know that putting anybody on a hundred percent FiO2 for a prolonged period of time it, that's that's not good okay that's a hundred percent FiO2 can lead to oxygen toxicity and can actually lead to ARDS and all kinds of other complications but with a high flow nasal cannula you're going to see that that tubing is a much longer and it's it's green where I where I do clinical in the hospital where I do clinical so that's how it looks different than just your typical nasal cannula the high flow because it is giving such high flow rates it is already heated and humidified which does wonders for the patient's nasal passages as far as preventing them from drying out which that's a huge problem with just your standard nasal cannula. You know that um, the oxygen is very, very drying to the nasal passages. So that can be a big problem, especially for patients that are on like blood thinners. Um, that oxygen from the nasal cannula can start drying out their, those nasal passages and they can start having nosebleeds and things like that. Now you can add humidification to nasal cannula, which I do recommend but with the high flow because the flow is so high it's already humidified it's already heated and the greatest advantage is that peep effect and since it's a nasal cannula the patient can still talk can still eat and can still communicate can drink and all those things that they can do with a regular nasal cannula so keep in mind that high flow nasal cannula it's gaining more and more attention as far as being a good alternative for clients with COPD that are experiencing like acute hypoxemia, they're in acute distress. Um, it's going to help them get that CO2 off. And uh, one more thing I forgot to mention with the nasal cannula, you know in the land of NCLEX you do not set the oxygen flow rate above 6 liters per minute with your nasal cannula on your COPD patients. Remember because their COPD patients, their drive to breathe is very much different than the drive to breathe for, for myself or for someone with, without COPD. For me, when CO2 builds up within my system, that stimulates me to breathe. All right, But our COPD patients get very tolerant to higher levels of CO2 so that cannot be their drive to breathe. Their drive to breathe is what we call the hypoxic drive. So what causes a COPD patient to breathe, what stimulates them to breathe is hypoxemia. So if you give them too much oxygen you're going to knock out that drive to breathe because they breathe when their oxygen level drops okay so remember that going into exams and going into NCLEX now the next device that I have mentioned is a simple face mask and I'm gonna be real blunt with you about a simple face mask to me the only time that I use a simple face mask is when say I have somebody that um, is not doing well with their nasal cannula because they're a mouth breather all right the simple face mask can give, you know, about it can give a, it can give more FiO2, um, but it's just not um, the a delivery of choice for several reasons. It prevents the patient from being able to talk. It prevents them from being able to eat. If your patient is claustrophobic, then they're not going to tolerate a simple face mask. So I will go to the simple face mask, like I said, when I have somebody that, you know, they just, uh, they're mouth breathers. And that mask, you know, will fit over their nose and mouth and they'll get that FiO2 that they need. Um, finally, I have the Venturi mask and this is considered a high flow device. Now Venturi masks, they look different than your simple face mask. A simple face mask is just simply a mask with tubing that is connected to the oxygen on the wall. 
So your simple face mask is basically your nasal cannula, but in a mask form. Now your Venturi mask is going to be connected to this blue plastic tubing and you're going to be able to dial up to a very precise amount of FiO2 based on however that mask is designed. Now where I do clinical, where I work, the different levels of FiO2 that you can attach to your Venturi mask, they're different colors. So let's say, and I'm just making this up off the top of my head, let's say that I want my patient to get 45% FiO2. Well, I will reach for the little yellow, say, um, adapter and attach that to the mask and the patient will get precisely 45% FiO2. So your Venturi mask is wonderful for COPD patients that need a very, very precise amount of FiO2 because we don't want to give them too much to knock out that hypoxic drive. Now the Venturi mask, again, like I have mentioned here, you can precisely titrate how much FiO2 that the patient gets um, by switching out the adapters or some Venturi masks just have dials that you can turn. Now the flow rate, again, can be uh, four to eight liters per minute, but that's just the flow rate, all right? That's not the determinant of how much oxygen your patient is getting. The FiO2 is the determinant of how much oxygen your patient is getting. And with a Venturi mask, it is very, very precise based on what you dial that FiO2 to or the adapter that you connect to the device. So the Venturi mask, if you run into a question on an exam and you have a patient that's a COPD patient and they're acutely desatting, then the Venturi mask is absolutely going to be um, your, your oxygen delivery device of choice. Now keep in mind that all of these devices here require that your patient be able to breathe in and out on their own. We're not talking about people that need to have BiPAP or mechanical ventilation. All these are devices that simply deliver FiO2. Um, now the high flow nasal cannula does help some with ventilation with CO2 removal, but in someone who is severely acidotic, um, we're gonna have to start looking into BiPAP or even mechanical ventilation. One more device that I don't have listed here on my board, but I want to mention real quick is called the non-rebreather. And that's where you'll see the mask and then you have the bag. <clears throat> and that's called the reservoir, right? And so the non-rebreather, it's called 100% non-rebreather. Um, it, the flow rates on it can be up to 15 liters per minute. Um, FiO2 percentages up to 100%. FiO2, we use non-rebreathers on someone who is acutely desatting, they're acutely hypoxemic, and to be honest, I use it when I know that this patient is about to need um, mechanical ventilation. They're about to need intubation and mechanical ventilation. I'll go grab the non-rebreather to try to keep their oxygen saturation up in the meantime. But what the non-rebreather does is it has a, a one-way valve between the mask part and that reservoir bag that prevents the patient from rebreathing air from, it prevents the patient from breathing room air, but it also prevents the patient from breathing what's been uh, exhaled into the bag. Um, it's called uh, an entrainment device, all right? So with the non-rebreather, you want to make sure that that bag is fully inflated and that your non-rebreather, you've got to remember that it is only a short-term fix. You cannot leave a patient on a non-rebreather mask for 24 hours or two days or whatever. If someone is sick enough to need a 100% non-rebreather, um, then they're sick enough 
that they're about to need something more invasive, um, intubation and mechanical ventilation. So non-rebreather, very short term, it is still considered a low flow device. And a variation of that is called the partial non-rebreather, which does allow a little bit um, of breathing of room air because it doesn't have all the valves that the 100% the non-rebreather does. So that's just kind of a quick overview of the auction devices that I feel you're, like you're going to run into in clinical, you're going to be tested over on your exams, and I hope you found this video helpful. Again, head over to thedoctornurse.com under the Smart Study Guide section is a cool little infographic I put together. If you're a visual person, that will be a great thing to help reinforce the concepts that I've talked about in this video. Thanks so much for watching my video. I hope that this has been helpful to you. Be sure and hit that subscribe button. Head over to thedoctornurse.com and subscribe to the mailing list. Free stuff is going out in email every week, so you don't want to miss out on that. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to hear from you guys real, real soon.